So I want to start by um, acknowledging that we're here on unceded Coast Salish territories, the lands of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish people, and give my thanks to the stewards of these lands. Um, what I wanted to take up in my wild idea was actually the, the question that Ajay had put forward, uh, which is the wild idea to address some of the challenges in my work. Um, and I'm doing that really, really deliberately because um, my wild idea for actually transforming society is um, that we need a revolutionary change. So um, that, I'm going to leave that part at that. But I want to start with um, <laughs> what I'm actually going to take up as a wild idea um, is addressing some of the challenges in social movement work. So I want to start by asking, and maybe this is something that people haven't come across, um, and maybe um, I might turn you off social change work by asking you this question, but how many folks here have been engaged in social change work and have experienced either themselves or other people burnout? Yeah, oh, Lee, a lot of people. How many folks, okay. Um, how many folks have either directly experienced or observed other people feeling disempowered and just feeling marginalized in our social movement organizing? Yeah, a lot of people. Um, how many people have just seen people leave social movement organizing because they just feel like, you know, they or we couldn't keep it up? Yeah, so a really common thread, right, is this common experience um, that folks in our movements, in our communities, solid, committed, dedicated people like ourselves are, are leaving our movements, are leaving our communities, and are leaving social change work. I mean, this is something that stood out to me, has stood out for me for, for over a decade. Um, and for me, it's, it's important to, to pin this as a persistent pattern. It's not about certain individuals. It's about what are the patterns in our social movements that we really need to address. So um, by way of example, I want to share some examples with you of folks. And this may resonate with you and what you've also experienced. So um, I've changed some names. But so Sheila was a, a young single mom that I was organizing with about uh, 12 years ago. And she was unable to afford childcare, which is why we need a living wage and we need a national lobby. Um, and she was unable to afford childcare to come to meetings, or sometimes she just didn't want to come to meetings because it was the only time she had, because of Generation Squeeze, to spend time with her kids, right? So she didn't want to spend that little bit of time that she had being in social movement organizing. Um, or someone else, Darla, who I've um, organized with for the past few years, who absolutely loves cooking for the movement. That's her skill, it's her gift, it's the love that she brings to the movement. But she felt that it wasn't really acknowledged, and she spent hours and hours doing it and spent hours doing nothing else. Um, or Lisa, who's a young queer black woman uh, that I organized with almost 15 years ago, who felt that all of her ideas were usually ignored in social movement contexts, but when she got angry about the fact that she was being ignored, she was readily dismissed as an angry black woman, right? That stereotype. So um, for me, there's a common trend where we spend a whole lot of time in social change work figuring out how do we get people recruited into our social change work. We put a lot of resources into figuring out how we can campaign and leverage resources in order to campaign and build practical skills. But we haven't put much thought at all, if, um, or very little thought, if at all, into how do we keep people engaged within social movements? How do we keep our people within our communities engaged in social movements? So for me, I think the challenge um, that I want to address, and I, I want to I suggest, if I were bold enough to do so, that it's one that we collectively face. It's not one that's individual. Is how do we create transformative social movements? And by transformative social movements, I mean how do we create social movements that are spaces where people are moved and called to be and also called to stay? How do we create transformative movements where we are connected to our sense of inspiration and purpose for the long haul? How do we create transformative movements where we are not only in resistance, but also in community with each other, where we are able to bring our whole selves, our honest selves, our fears, our passions, our vulnerabilities, and our intimacies into our work? And this is hard, right? So um, my wild idea is that in order to do this, in order to build transformative social movements, one of the key things that we need to do is that we need to organize ourselves internally as we wish to see the world. Social movements cannot only seek to transform unethical structures, political, social, economic structures externally in dominant society, but we also need to be transformative ourselves. We need to prioritize building movement practices and structures that sustain freedom so that social change work is not just something we do, but something that we embody. So some examples here. What would it mean for Sheila, the person that I talked about, to have childcare center within our movement? So we know that we're struggling to provide childcare, right? We know that we're lacking at a policy level to have childcare needs met for families. So what does it mean to take that on as a movement, to recognize that as a movement, that that is a political priority for us? So that people like Sheila can attend and participate in our organizing. And even more so, what if there was actually progressive child center activities that critically engage youth and recognize that children are vital parts of creating change? 
And even more so, imagine if men in our movement carried the majority of the work of doing childcare in our organizing. What would that look like? Imagine if men in our movement carried all of the burdens of secretarial work, of child work, of preparing food, all of the labor that makes our social movements possible. What if men carried the burden of that organizing? So that it allows for women like Darla, not just Sheila, but also women like Darla, who are doing all the cooking, to take on more diverse roles like public speaking, perhaps. So at my workplace, for example, and you know, this isn't, this isn't impossible. Um, there are lots of grassroots collectives that organize themselves this way, but also within um, structural spaces, this is possible. At my paid work, for example, everyone gets paid the same. Every single person is paid exactly the same, despite the fact that we live in a society that would suggest that someone who is an outreach worker or a skilled legal advocate should get paid more than someone who works in the kitchen. Um, and so for us, internally, it is so important to challenge that. Oh, that's my phone. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> whoo, done. Um, so what would it mean that this, you know, this is a tremendous gesture towards valuing all knowledge and labor as valuable. It's also a tremendous gesture to actually undo, actively undo the fact that our, our economy is structured in such fundamentally capitalist, gendered, and racialized ways that always delegate women of color in the most underpaid and devalued positions, even in social justice organizations. What would it mean to center marginalized people like Lisa within social justice work, so the woman who was tokenized and dismissed as angry? What would it mean to, to celebrate her not as someone who is a token, but someone who is a brilliant, talented, creative genius who is best positioned, actually, to lead social justice movements as someone who experiences so many forms of oppression? What would it be like to have every single organization that is social justice oriented in our community, our unions, every single social change organization, imagine if every single one of them had a queer women of color leading those organizations? Or better yet, what would it mean to center abundance so that we actually had multiple queer women of color leading our organizations? So for me, my wild idea is what would it mean to have ourselves, our whole selves, and not just strategies and campaign goals as a foundation to our work? And so um, I'm just going to, I just need to say this because I have to drop some marks in social change. Um, so you know, Marxist theorists have long articulated how under capitalism we have alienated our modes of production and our own labor. But what about our affective sense of alienation from each other? We're each so isolated in our social relationships. And so I think intentionally created movements that center emancipation, that center social relationships, that center collective purpose over individual competition, that center care and trust are profoundly anti-capitalist and anti-oppressive. They also create resilient movements, sustainable movements, intergenerational movements. I want to end with a quote by novelist Eduardo Galeano. He writes, utopia is on the horizon. I, when I walk two steps, it takes two steps back. I walk 10 steps, and it is 10 steps even further away. What is utopia for? It is for this, for walking, end quote. And so in echoing Eduardo Galeano, I want to conclude by asking how do we and our social movements become free, not only in the future, but now in our everyday acts and practices of liberation. Thank you.